Hi everyone, thank you for joining us for this webinar. Before we begin, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Lauren Sands. I am with LifeMars and I am going to kick this off for us. So before we begin, I just want to let everyone know that we will be having 10 minutes of Q&A at the end. So if you'd like to save your questions for, um, for the live Q&A, please feel free. Otherwise, you may go ahead and shoot your uh, questions in the chat. This work, this, can you guys hear me? This uh, webinar is called Workforce Diaspora, Adapting to Secure the Remote Workforce. It's presented by LifeArts and Darktrace in tandem. We have a great agenda today. I'm going to highlight just a few key pieces of the agenda, and we're gonna make the best use of your time with the 30 minutes that we have. One, what is the workforce diaspora? What is the business impact? We're gonna talk about the new cyber threat landscape and the pervasive challenges. We'll definitely cover an interesting case study. And we'll also recap everything that you learned today in securing the remote workforce. Then we'll begin Q and A. So what is the workforce diaspora? The workforce diaspora that we're living through today is borderless transcending geography, networks, and traditional limitations on business operations and professional collaboration, but at a cost. Securing the remote workforce has never been more critical, especially in the face of economic downturn and cyber risk, as employees are relying on email and using more cloud services and SaaS-based collaboration tools with less oversight than ever before. IBM re reports the cost of data breach has risen 12% over the past five years and now costs 3.92 million on average. 42% of U.S. workers who did not telecommute previously are doing so now. Now I'll introduce you to our speakers. Andre? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andre Krehel, and I'm a part of the team at Alive First, and my, war, my role is perform and conduct forensic investigations. I'm very privileged to be here today with Justin Fear, who came out of the uh, intelligence agency and community and been uh, uh, over our 10 years in uh, experience in a cyber defense. Justin, just give us a little bit of a background on yourself, please. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And uh, thank you to all the listeners uh, who joined us today as well. Um, yeah, I've been working in IT for the better part of 15 years, uh, worked for the U.S. government uh, as a contractor uh, in uh, the intelligence community um, for about, about 12 years. Uh, and now I've been with Darktrace uh, coming up on uh, four and a half years now. Uh, and with Dark Trace, I, I wear a couple different roles, but uh, one of the my favorite parts of the job is actually, you know, utilizing the tool and working with our customers to operationalize their Dark Trace deployments, or really just think a little bit differently about how they uh, interrogate the uh, data that they have. Um, and my background is I've been doing this type of work for two decades, primarily conduct high level forensic investigations and offensive missions in a, in a government, especially the specialized uh, military units. Um, I'm uh, very privileged that we, over the years, LIFER has built a very good reputation, especially with the federal law enforcement agencies such as the FBI and the United States Secret Service, and we led it to many successful indictment and prosecution of some of the cyber criminals that we, uh, been seeing, especially in the ransomware and nation state uh, space. Um, our company uh, is headquartered in uh, New York, and uh, we have another office in Europe. You can see us from providing the cyber ambulance, like reactive type of services, into response and digital forensics, to very proactive type of the missions. We built a forensic laboratory in the U.S., uh, conducted over 300 forensic investigations just to related to ransomware. Uh, provided the support to the insurance carriers and uh, looked through business email compromise um, matters as well as some of the nation's uh, state attacks that are ongoing even through, during the COVID um, era. Justin, I'm going to hand over to you for uh, introduction of Dark Trace. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Dark Trace has been around coming up on almost six and a half years now. Um, and uh, it, it's uh, it's grown immensely, as you can see here. Uh, you know, this I joke a lot that 
oftentimes when I get on stage or host a webinar, this screen is already out of date by the time it comes across the monitor. But um, just some kind of uh, high level stats, we're up over 3000 customers. Uh, we are deployed in 110 countries. We truly are a global company uh, with 44 offices uh, you know, around the globe um, and over a thousand employees. Um, you know, we've run, we've won numerous awards. And, you know, one thing that I've gotten the privilege of, of seeing grow throughout the last few years is this little bottom piece here, uh, which shows where we stand across the different industry verticals. And year after year, I'm seeing those other industries kind of catch up, you know, to those financial services and, and uh, technology companies. So um, it is really kind of interesting to see uh, how all the different uh, industries are evolving. Thank you for introduction, uh, Justin, to Dazgrace. And I would say it's one of the leading um, platform when it comes to uh, artificial intelligence and how can you process the data maybe in a more unique way, especially when we look at the network flow and events that are being conducted across the virus. Muted. Uh, thank you, Justin, for uh, um, the introduction to Dazgrace. And um, also, it's one of the very, I would say, special type of a platforms when it comes to artificial intelligence and how would you actually detect some of the threat actor actions when it comes to the interactions of the system. What is really business impact um, in uh, current employee, remote employee momentum? What we're seeing is that many of the businesses were not ready to actually enable business function and infrastructure to support such a base population of employees being handled. We, for example, experience what we call a split tunneling where employee actually reaches the network and internet resources one way, while the corporate network is completely different direction. That creates significant challenges for organizations to actually capture what action has been done on that remote endpoint for that employee. And um, it's also exposing the organization and creates a layer of the risk when um, there is a diversification in the flow of the data from that employee station. So it's not something that uh, I would say businesses were completely ready. They were not ready to perform or conduct 100% remote workforce and then reinforce the same level of the policies, monitoring, detection, and respond through the infrastructure. Justin, I'm going to hand over to you for what you've seen uh, in the wild and in our cyberspace in terms of a new threat landscape and various pervasive challenges and techniques that a threat actor has been using. Yeah, so um, I think like anything, you know, uh, the attackers exploit current world day events. And, you know, Dark Trace, we're already seeing a major spike in email. Uh, Email, it shouldn't come as any surprise. It's always going to be the most porous point of your network. But we've seen an increase in spear phishing uh, attacks that are COVID-19 themed or remote worker, you know, themed, you know, to, uh, you know, trick folks into clicking that link or opening that attachment. Um, but I think the other thing that we've seen an interesting trend is, is just companies embracing technologies they never thought they would have had to. So, uh, you know, companies that didn't think telework was ever an option for them uh, literally overnight had to find a telework, you know, uh, you know, infrastructure, uh, didn't have much time to do testing, get it rolled out and working to keep their workforce working. Um, and so that opens up a whole other element of security problems. Uh, you know, for these companies. Um, and then, you know, uh, last but not least, I think the attack surface has expanded probably three or fourfold. Um, you know, we were worried about shadow IT before COVID, but now you have to worry about all of the residential home networks that probably are, you know, frighteningly, uh, you know, uh, unsecure, uh, you know, allowing all sorts of, uh, you know, threat actors into the network. You touch on very interesting point, and that's the business email compromise. I think it was ranked almost like a number one crime with a ransomware by the FBI. And uh, there were various briefings, especially for Zoom uh, sessions, Zoom booming, a net scalar exploitation that come from the group called APT10. 
out of the uh, Asian military unit uh, during the COVID, especially since December, I would say the March, that group has been heavily, heavily active and continues now with the APP41 campaign. So uh, definitely business email compromise and looking at the email, it's something that um, has been on the radar for many years. And now with the remote infrastructure, when everyone wants to closely monitor how the employees are communicating, I, I think it's becoming even more critical. So that was, that was a very valid, valid point. Yep. So, you know, one thing I think is important is, you know, I advise a lot of our customers, you know, about embracing artificial intelligence and AI. And, you know, there's a lot of marketing speak out there, but um, I want to take this opportunity to just first, you know, talk very high level about how Darktrace utilizes AI, and then go into a little bit more detail about something we're excited about that we call, uh, you know, the cyber AI analyst. So, so Darktrace was first put on the map by the way at which we attack security. Um, we don't believe in rules and signatures. We don't believe in historical data per se uh, to, in order to predict what's gonna happen in the future. Um, what we do is we're utilizing unsupervised machine learning and we're tracking every aspect of your cloud environment, your on-prem network environment, your SaaS environment, your IoT environment, really if, it, if it's attached to your network in any one shape, way, or form, uh, we are collecting that data, we're watching it, and we're establishing a normal, a baseline. And from that, we can actually spot when things start acting outside of their baseline. Um, and this is where the sophisticated math comes in, you know, determining what's just, you know, a change in, you know, your pattern versus what's a change in your pattern over time, you know, compared with other things. So um, it's taking an inside out approach to security. And then, of course, we also have a piece that does response. So, you know, if the artificial intelligence has gone and showed you something that's very unusual happening on your network, um, we actually do have the ability now to take dozens and dozens of different types of actions. But one of the things I'm most excited about is what's called the cyber AI analyst. And so what Dark Choice has been doing is over the last four years, we've been collecting data off of our own analyst team. And we've got over 100 analysts spread out across the globe. Some of them are former intelligence officers like myself, and some of them are, you know, right out of college university. And we tracked every mouse click and every keystroke of them. And we determined that regardless of your skill set, when an analyst is presented with certain model breaches or inputs, they tend to ask a lot of the same questions. And so we were able to co collect that data for about four years and using supervised machine learning, train the AI version of a human analyst. So instead of me asking questions, going out and finding the answers to those questions and developing a hypothesis of what uh, you know, a series of model breaches might mean, the AI analyst is actually doing that for you. Um, it is meant to assist your human team that you already have um, and just help them to operate a little bit more efficiently and take some of the more mundane tasks out of their, uh, their workload. Um, just to give you an idea, you know, the cyber AI platform right now, this is just some of the things we're seeing on a pretty regular basis right now. Uh, social engineering, impersonation, spoofing, uh, external data loss, um, fearware attacks, and and I think it's safe to say that uh, you know uh, offensive uh, or malicious AI is on the horizon as well. So I would like to now ask you, Justin, to perhaps walk us through the case study, um, and if this is I know you've got too many on your belt and uh, but probably like maybe most common is really still the spare phishing campaign and, and an email that originated either to drive a download or click on a link or a content malicious word document or Excel documents to be running through it. Yeah, so this was, a, you know, again, you could argue whether this was AI based malware or not, regardless, there was some form of autonomous, uh, you know, uh, action, you know, uh, embedded in it. So I'll just give you a rundown of kind of the series of events that led to this. Um, so ultimately the theme here is, you know, with this particular malware, we, we felt that every stage of the attack or the kill chain had actually been improved. It was made more, uh, more productive. 
And so in this case, an employee at a law firm, which was the industry this was in, uh, you know, pretty typical, fell victim to a spam phishing campaign. Um, and that eventually led to, you know, the self-propagating TrickBot malware. Um, for those of our listeners that aren't familiar, TrickBot is, uh, is actually an information stealing piece of malware uh, that leverages some worming type functionality utilizing uh, SMB exploits similar to WannaCry that I hope everybody is uh, sadly familiar with. And in this case, the two infected devices um, uh, you know, actually showed signs of what's called the Empire PowerShell post infection framework. Um, and it's, this is commonly used by uh, human attackers to actually facilitate covert hands-on keyboard type attacks. Um, and this attack showed signs of the malware that we actually think were experimental, looking to transform its data locking capabilities. Um, the attackers were obviously uh, trying to diversify their payloads to probably maximize their potential profits, uh, stealing banking details first and then locking users out until a ransom was paid. So, you know, they're kind of broadening their, their business uh, footprint. Um, we feel pretty confident based off what we're seeing and what a lot of industry leaders are saying is that AI-driven malware will probably self-propagate via a series of autonomous decisions, um, you know, intelligently tailored to the parameters of a very specific system. Um, and worm-style attacks will eventually have an understanding of the target environment and they'll choose what lateral movement techniques to use based off of what it's seeing around it, et cetera. Um, you know, we also think autonomous malware is gonna learn how to, you know, do the opposite of what Darktrace is doing. Observe what normal business operations is in order to perform reconnaissance without tripping any flags and in order to become stealthier by blending in with regular, uh, what's deemed normal business traffic. Um, Many, in, in this particular case, uh, you know, uh, Darktrace was able to catch most of this, uh, you know, throughout, uh, you know, the kill chain, and uh, we were able to alert them pretty early on, but it was just interesting to see um, how this uh, potential uh, case has changed from what we've seen in the past. And would you say, Justin, that um, these attacks on email, um, user behind it, are getting more sophisticated that the artificial intelligence will play more significant role in the future in detecting them? Well, yeah, I think it goes both ways. I think just as we have to embrace it as the defenders, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the bad guys have already started embracing it as well. And we're already starting to see that. Some of the spear phishing cases, um, you know, we're seeing them using sentiment analysis or uh, you know, language processing to match the linguistic notes of the person they're spoofing. So um, they're 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 getting quite advanced. We've even seen some cases of uh, deep fakes being used. You know, a video of the CEO being sent out to all the employees that wasn't real. Yeah, great. Um, another example of um, how email can get more sophisticated was the. Um, Ransomware that was deployed last year in December called Doppelpaymer or Bitpaymer. And what we observed was that the botnet called Drydex was modified to avoid many of the detections on the endpoint. It leveraged very clever, sophisticated obfuscation and cascade effect of deployment. And here you have a little bit of how it was deployed through macro, download, some scripting, some internal objects, and a download, and how it was actually downloaded and injected into the process itself. And it used something called process hollowing that we've seen, I would say, the nation state type of malware maybe seven to 10 years ago. It's a very, very uh, clever uh, way of the execution. What we had to do in that scenario, actually our team, in our digital forensic lab had to develop what we call the cyber vaccine. And we had to analyze that strain of the virus, look through it, what kind of indicator of the compromise it has, what is the lateral movement, how it's being propagated from the host to host. And then we deploy in almost 48 hours, 
a program called Cyber Vaccine that was um, executed on all of the computers to basically remove the strain of the botnet itself. And um, what was um, unique about this environment that it was a heavily financial training type of a floor where we had to look at the latency of the environment. We had to be sure that we are not going to uh, perform any type of actions that would slow down or in any way inflicted any wounds in the trading of itself. So it was a little bit more challenging to get that testing at that level done um, and conduct through the entire flora and, uh, and their organization. It is also important to know that the organization did not have any network tools such as dot trace in a place that could help them to detect a lot of movement, the moving from one compromised host to another. And what we've seen is that um, gaining the visibility, gaining visibility on the, on the uh, endpoint, gaining visibility on the network, have very good threat intelligence is a key to the success. And Justin could tell you, you are sometimes only as good as your intelligence that you are collecting, that you can tell about yourself. So it's very important that organizations do revisit how are they gaining visibility? How are they gaining intelligence about their processes, their network flows? What is really happening at the end, at the edges of the network? What is being conducted inside of a network? What kind of lot of movement is normal through the organization and what is abnormal? And most of the organizations still, I would say, fail, and we're adding more and more tools to get us more visibility, but yet we're still failing in efficient to answer a very simple question. Tell me something meaningful about my network that I didn't know before. Tell me something meaningful about my endpoint that we didn't know before. And uh, forensic investigations then do come as a surprise when we um, present execu executives with some of the findings and uh, demystify some of the myths about their own infrastructure that they believe uh, they had. It is important that achieving cyber resilience in very hybrid environment where most of us live in a cloud on-prem and something in between what often some of the companies call on-demand environment, um, it's not the easiest. It requires a unique role of a cyber architect to basically come in and look through current level of what is a proactive and reactive measure at that organization and tailor that to cyber risk through the minimization of what is important for that brand, what kind of tools have been deployed and what training and what type of outsourcing uh, have been provided. I like what Justin pointed out here, that cyber analyst through AI. That's a very powerful statement. It really means that we are not eliminating any uh, cyber market job positions. What it really means that the TDU's work of millions of alerts, we can process in an intelligent way. And we can look at the behavior at the network, endpoint and network and make some meaningful detection from the alerts which help us to properly respond. When it comes to incident response, we're always seeking for that patient zero. We're always seeking for that initial vector of the compromise. We want to understand what is the level of sophistication with threat actor that we are dealing with. What is a containment, eradication, a recovery? And what forensic analysis is really needed to support it? So it is vital for us that we are focusing on the incident response in a holistic cycle, protect, detect, analyze, and respond. While system management tools can give us understanding of some of the suspected malicious software, downloads the network traffic, we still require some level of visibility and data processing then, um, that is needed at the level from the analysts to do. And often these do come as a 40 different platforms that that analyst actually has to go through it and has to understand, which is not the easiest task to perform. In a burger analogy, we know that um, scale burger will measure 
and not leave much of a evidence behind. And that's what we've seen from the nation state. APD-41, one of the threat actors, when they intrude the environment, they also use a decoy. They deploy ransomware at that site, which basically pinpoint the uh, examiners to the wrong impression. The impression is that perhaps this was the ransomware type of attack and not the effort to steal my data, to take my intellectual property. And so don't get fooled by any of the actions of the burglar. It could be that a second intrusion is right around the corner or have been already done and conducted in your organization. Now, when it comes to the checklist uh, for the organization, Justin, what would you suggest for the workforce? What would you recommend to executives, directors, and managers to seek for and um, have some level of understanding when it comes to managing their environment through the remote uh, connectivity into the organization. Yeah, so for the IT and security teams, you know, you already kind of laid it out with this checklist here. One thing I would add is um, it's not enough to have good VPNs up and running and stable, um, but get visibility into the very traffic that is traversing your VPN tunnels. Um, so we've spent a lot of time over the last eight weeks, you know, since kind of uh, the work from home uh, dynamic has changed, just helping all of our customers, uh, you know, get set up with VPN log ingestion so that they can now, you know, spot all these anomalies from the VPN traffic coming in as if nobody actually even left the buildings. Um, the other thing I'd say is, you know, getting a proper uh, alert notifications set up and, and your process set up is important. Um, you know, uh, if you look back at uh, the 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 NotPetya case about a year ago against uh, the big shipping firm, Wired article, Wired magazine did a great article about it. Um, that entire global network was brought down in two hours. And so, anywhere you can speed up your detection and response piece, um, I think is imperative, especially right now uh, in in today's kind of world. Well, I could not agree with you more, Justin. That um, we all know that at some point of time, we will have something from a light cyber cold to maybe very dangerous cyber cancer. And recovery really comes through very focused and strategically positioned into the response process. It may be in a form of a playbook, maybe in a form of the exercise or the tabletop, but we've been working with many victims. And um, it's often the enterprises who are first time in this type of situation have have struggled to come through very more mature um, and a concrete type of a response where we can provide like a unified effort into the remediation eradication of the malware from uh, from the enterprise and it's not the easiest at that point of a time we ask that enterprise to run really 24 7 crisis hotline or crisis command room and work with the whole team uh, to perform um, removal of the malware and a threat actor from the organization. So um, gaining visibility through network tools endpoint, it's, uh, it's very critical. Another one that came up to me surprising was that most of the organization did not test their VPN solutions um, and their security. And that's visible from APT41, who literally exploited VPN that trust in the concentrator and connections and a Citrix gateways that haven't been patched. Um, and those gateways, my understanding was that were not designed to handle 100% workforce going remote, maybe up to 30, 40% in the capacity. So I guess there has been some um, downgrade in the security uh, and uh, in those devices and how they have been uh, conducted uh, through, through, the, through the enterprise. Well. That concludes our webinar. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending the webinar uh, from uh, Dark Grace and Alifers. Very happy and privileged to be with Justin and uh, give you some wisdom when it comes to remote workforce being securely monitored through various means of artificial intelligence and incident response process. We're looking forward to our next session 
and um, wishing you all safe and secure afternoon. Thank you, and have a nice day. Thank you.